I think all of us are at least in one regard or another somewhat familiar with much of what is said in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 has been a camping ground for a lot of people who are religious speculators. They look in Matthew 24 and then they look throughout the landscape of uh, the Middle East and perhaps even in other places and they think they see the fulfilling of some of the things that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24. But actually what Jesus is doing in, in, in the major portion of Matthew chapter 24 is dealing with the destruction of Jerusalem that occurred in the first century. You, 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 I think all of us remember that Jesus was uh, showing the disciples in Matthew 24 the temple that sat in Jerusalem. It would, it would have been Herod's temple, uh, the temple where the Jews worshipped. And, and uh, Jesus said, you know, noticing this, he said, I, I want you to know that uh, one stone that is of this temple, verse 2, shall not be left upon another, uh, that shall not be thrown down. And so Jesus is saying, you know, it's going to be sometime in the future that you're going to see this temple destroyed. And so they then asked Jesus about this. Jesus, when, when are these things going to happen? Tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Now, I believe that what Jesus is doing, in, in, uh, or really what the, the apostles or the disciples are asking him in that verse, can really be broken down into two questions that pertain to the destruction of Jerusalem and then that pertains to the end of the world or the end of the age. Now, and I think the bulk of Matthew 24 deals with the destruction of Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, I tell people, if you want to get a good handle on understanding Matthew 24, do this. Decide that you're going to place Matthew 24, at least a portion of it, between some bookends. You know, if you have a bookshelf and you have a line of books there and you put a bookend on, uh, uh, on this side and a bookend on this side, then they sort of hold it together. Well, that's what the Bible has done with the signs that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. And I'm going to show you what these, uh, or what this, these bookends are. If you look in chapter 23 of Matthew, in verse 36, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. That's bookend number one. Jesus then begins to string together a lot of things that's going to come upon this generation. Now if you open your Bibles or turn the page over to Matthew 24 and verse 35, you see the other bookend. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. There are your bookends. And those verses in between that deal with the destruction of Jerusalem. But I believe there is a dramatic shift that takes place in verses 35 and 36. Jesus points out, heaven and earth, in verse 35, will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And then he says in verse 36, and these were the verses that were included in our reading this evening, but of that day and hour, now what day and hour does he mean? Well, the day and hour that heaven and earth will pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And then Jesus, Jesus begins to elaborate upon what we often refer to as his second coming, when Jesus will return. Uh, and this is something that I want to talk about this evening. I want to talk about the return of Christ, not in the traditional way, not in the, uh, you know, the accepted way that we usually talk about this, but we're going to be discussing it from the standpoint of looking at various ideas pertaining to the second coming of Christ. Now, in Acts chapter 1, we find a promise specifically being made pertaining to the Lord's return or His second advent, His second coming. Now when he had spoken these things, that is, given the apostles the great commission, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. 
who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. That's Acts chapter 1 verses 9 through 11. So this is a promise that is made. Jesus is going to make a second return or a return. Now, about that there absolutely should be no debate. About that, even I, I would I, I would even go so far as to say there should be no controversy surrounding the return of Jesus, and certainly there should be no confusion about that. However, that does not seem to be the case, because when you think about the return of Christ, there are broken images about the return of Christ. You can talk to just a pocket of people, and they're going to have their own idea about the coming of Christ. They've got their own specific ideas, their understandings. They, you know, lump some verses together or perhaps misuse some verses and they put together a theory pertaining to the second coming of Christ. And this is what I want to look at this evening. I want to look, I'm not going to do an extensive study on that, but I would like for us to look at some, some, some broken images as it applies to the return of Christ. And, and I think a good place to begin with this is, is the broken image that, that, that surrounds those that I would refer to as date setters. You know, there are people and have been people throughout the years who have decided that they, through their special means of calculation and through, you know, their research and their study, they're able to come up and pinpoint the exact time that Jesus is going to return. As a matter of fact, the people that do this but many times mistakenly believe that there are signs that we can look for. That, well, you know, somebody says one time, well, you know, the Bible says. And then what they'll do is they'll, they'll quote what I can simply refer to sometimes is uh, chimney corner scriptures. There's something that's made up. Well, you know, the Bible says that in the last days you'll not be able to tell one season from another. And so we may have an extremely mild winter or an extremely cool summer. And as I say, uh, this is a sign. The Lord's going to return. You can't tell one season from another. Well, Bob doesn't say that. Bob doesn't say that at all. But that has given rise to this idea of looking at signs and, and trying to decide just when the Lord is going to return. As a matter of fact, there have been over the years, over the centuries, at least 200 date setters. People who have looked at various things and they have come away believing that they can pinpoint the precise time that the Lord is going to return. As a matter of fact, the very first documentation of this is recorded in the writings of the Jewish historian Josephus. And Josephus said a man by the name of Thyudas in AD 44 purported to demonstrate to the people that he was the returning Messiah. I am the Messiah. And he led at least 400 people off into the desert. And he is the first who was a date setter. Now Josephus, as I say, records this, and, and the Romans beheaded him and many of his followers. But he was just one of many. In the third century, there was a Catholic priest who predicted that Christ would return in 500 A.D., and somebody said, well, how did he come up with that? Well, what he did is he took the calculations of the size of Noah's ark. And somehow or another, he looking at the size of Noah's ark and calculating that size, the cubits and so forth, he come up with a certain date in 500 A.D. Well, 500 A.D., as you know, came and went, and there was no return of Christ. You fast forward 500 years from that at the year 1000 and there were many, many date setters. Many predicted that Jesus would return in the year 1000. As a matter of fact, there was a period of mass hysteria surrounding that. But like 500 AD, 1000 came and went and the Lord did not make His appearance. I guess... The, as far as modern date setters are concerned, 
one of the ones that I think most of us would recognize is a man who was a Jehovah's Witness, Charles Taz Russell. And Charles Taz Russell, through his calculation and through the events that were taking place in World War I in Europe, uh, he decided that 1914 was going to be the year that Jesus returned. Well, when 1914 fell through, he picked 1918. And when that fell through, Russell picked 1920. Then he picked 1925 and 1944 and 1975. And finally, the Jehovah's Witnesses decided on 1994. Well, all of those came and went. And someone has predicted every year that the Lord would return every single year. Now, just a little FYI, there's a guy out here that's predicting that the Lord's going to return in 2016. And But I'm going to tell you, you put as much stock in that as 1914 or 44 AD or 500 or 1,000. And you know how I know that? Because of the words that Jesus spoke just that we read just a little bit ago. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven. Jesus says there's not going to be any signs to my return. Notice how he, how he points this out. He said in verse 38 of the text that we had read, For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Everything just continued on. People buy and people sell. People marry. People live. Their lives are just going on about their day-to-day -day activities. And did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. No signs, no ability has been given to us to be able to calculate the Lord's return. That's a broken image of the return of Jesus. Another broken image of the return of Jesus is the secret coming of Jesus and the wrath now, how many of us have heard about the rapture? You know, the rapture, and a lot of people don't realize that part and parcel to the doctrine of the rapture, which really gained a lot of footing with the Left Behind series of movies, uh, one, one of the important factors about the rapture is that it advocates actually a secret return of Jesus. I I Jesus is go they say that Jesus is going to return and nobody's going to be able to see Him. Nobody's going to be able to hear Him. Nobody's going to be able to know that He returned other than the fact that all of the living saints are going to be caught up and taken from the earth. Oh, and by the way, all of the dead saints are going to be raised and all of these are going to be taken up off of the earth. But nobody's going to see Jesus when this occurs. And this is the secret coming of Christ that involves the so-called rapture. Now somebody said, well now, wait a minute. You know, what about Jesus coming as a thief in the night? What about Jesus coming in the clouds? They've got an interesting take on that. They, they believe that the idea of Jesus coming as a thief in the night is that he comes unnoticed. Just like a thief. A thief will come unnoticed. Not, un, you know, not we understand it to be unannounced. Unless he's coming unnoticed. What about coming in the clouds? And every eye shall see him. Well, coming in the clouds, that means he's going to be obscured like something that's hidden in the clouds. And you'll not be able to observe him. And you will not be able to see him. And so he's going to come and he's going to rapture, that is, catch away all of the saved. And he's going to rapture all of the dead saved. And they'll all be raptured off of this earth. Well, somebody said, Wait, don't they get that? From some? Well, they like to look at what Paul said when he wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And they feel that this is something that substantiates that belief. Paul is writing to the Thessalonians to remind them that they have hope. They don't need to be concerned if, if they have loved ones that have died that they are without hope. And here's how Paul expresses that. 
Beginning at verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, that is, die, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the, uh, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, you know, all you have to do is have a casual reading of that. And you can see this idea of a secret return is impossible. And, and, and here's why. I want you to notice there's nothing secret about what occurs in verse 16. He's going to return with a shout. A shout. You know, I don't know what the shout's going to be. In all probability, the shout may be, according to John 5, to all of those who are in the grave. You know, when the Lord returns, all those who are in the grave are going to hear His voice and come forth. It may be exactly what He said to Lazarus, come forth. That's going to be a shout. That's going to be something that's audible. Oh, and not only that, with the voice of the archangel. And so there's going to be a lot of noise that takes place here. Oh, and the trumpet of God will sound. And when he says that we're caught up, we'll be caught up with him, I want you to notice verse 17 says, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. None of these other things that they say that are going to take place after that will occur. Because when, when, when the Lord returns and the saved are caught up to be with Him and we're ushered into judgment, not going to be coming back to this earth. Not going to be setting foot upon this earth. We'll always be with the Lord where He is. But yeah, that's, a, that's a broken image of the return of Christ. The idea that there's going to be a secret second coming and the rapture. Then there are those who advocate that after this secret coming there will be another coming of Christ and the battle of Armageddon will take place. You know, I was talking to somebody out in the foyer just a little bit ago, so what about the third coming? Well, that's kind of where we fall in here. It kind of falls into a, a, a third coming. They don't call it that. It's, a, it's the idea that Jesus is going to come back with a mighty army. And He's going to come riding this, this white horse and He's going to have perhaps more than a million man army. And they're going to meet in the valley of Megiddo and there's going to be this great battle of Armageddon. A literal battle where the forces of good will at this time defeat entirely the forces of evil. And... Is that what the Bible teaches? Is this what we find revealed in the Scriptures? Well, somebody said, well, Jay, oh, I think I, I read about Armageddon in, 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 in the book of Revelation. I, I, can, I can read about a battle. And what don't you think that there's going to... You know, the problem with that is folks are basing an entire belief system upon some symbolic language. And they're basing an entire belief system not only upon symbolic language, but their interpretation of that symbolic language. And not only based upon symbolic language and their interpretation of it, but they're basing it upon a fact, upon something that Jesus said was in fact going to take place shortly. Revelation 1 and verse 1. John was told to write the things which he was being shown and he did so and wrote them and signified, that is, wrote them in signs and symbols about things he said which must shortly come to pass. And as we studied in our class here a trimester or so ago on the book of Revelation, all of this had, had reference to not the end of time as we know it, not the second coming of Jesus as revealed in the Scriptures, but it was discussing the, the end of the persecution that was taking place at the hands of the Roman Empire. Not the end of time. You, you know, 
here's something you need to think about and, and, and address. And we, well, we've talked about this even in, in, in making other points. How can we fathom that Jesus is going to be leading forces into a literal battle? Are we thinking that the Prince of Peace is going to carry a sword and commission His disciples to slaughter others? I mean, this is the picture here. And remember what Jesus said to Pilate in the 18th chapter of the book of John in verse 36? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. That's not the kind of kingdom that I have. I don't have a kingdom like that. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, what did Jesus say would happen? My disciples would fight. But my, my, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. And there's not going to be this future battle. And by the way, let me challenge you about something. I'm going to challenge you about that. You know, you can take various Bible words and you can lift a word from this verse and a word from this verse and you can put them together and it seems as though you have a scriptural concept. The, the scriptures in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, chapter 16, it talks about a battle. And there are other verses that talk about Armageddon. But now what's happened is somebody's come along and they pulled that word out and they pulled that word out and they put them together and lo and behold, they got the phrase the battle of Armageddon. You look in your Bible. That phrase as I just spoke it does not exist. The Bible, your Bible, my Bible does not talk about the battle of Armageddon. That comes as a result of taking a word from here and a word from there, putting them together, and developing a concept. Does it talk about a battle? Yes. Yes, there was a gathering together to do battle. Does it talk about Armageddon? Yes. It talks about the Valley of Megiddo. But it doesn't talk about it in the context that people have talked about it and put it together. That is a broken image of the return of Jesus. Another broken image of, uh, uh, pertaining to the return of Jesus is Jesus actually came, but He came in the form of the Holy Spirit. That would be the second coming of Christ. That Jesus, when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, that that fulfilled the promise that He made to come upon the disciples. I want to show you where this concept was born. This concept comes from a misreading, I believe, of, Matt, of John chapter 14. They'll, they'll read passages like this. And Jesus said in verse 16 of John 14 at, to the apostles, And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper, that He may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be with you. Then He says this in verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And so somebody said, we see right there. Right there. When we, in Acts 2, verses 1-4, through 4, when the apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit, Jesus came as He promised that He would. And so that's the idea. You see these broken images. That's the idea that Jesus came in the form of the Holy Spirit or to baptize the apostles in the Holy Spirit. Then there is the second coming of Jesus in Roman Catholicism. It was like we talked about this morning, Roman Catholicism is in the news. What people don't realize and don't understand when we talk about Roman Catholicism and we point out various ideas and doctrines about Roman Catholicism. It's not because you won't pick on Roman Catholicism. It's because you need to expose this in light of what the Scriptures teach. You know, sometimes we feel an affinity for a group of people who may on one issue or another seem to have the same belief system that we do, whether it's abortion, uh, you know, homosexual marriage, whatever. And so we kind of tend to think, well, maybe we're soulmates here. But when it comes to Roman Catholicism, there's nothing that can be said about that doctrine or about that church 
by that organization that would prompt us to want to be soulmates, and especially as it pertains to the second coming of Christ. Now, if you talk to a Roman Catholic priest, he's going to tell you, I believe in the second coming of Christ. I, I want to put a quotation up here. This is, from, this is from the former Pope, Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict had this to say in quoting some of the verses that we're looking at this evening. Then the Son of Man will come upon the clouds in the sky with great power and glory. The Son of Man is Jesus Himself who links the present with the future. Now here comes a lot of double speak. The ancient words of the prophets finally come, found a center in the person of the Messiah of Nazareth. He is the central event that in the midst of the troubles of this world remains a firm and stable point. And then he concludes this. For this reason Jesus does not describe the end of the world and when he uses apocalyptic images he does not conduct himself like a visionary. Now, if you were to look at the context of all that Pope Benedict said about that, what he's talking about here, he is talking about the Catholic celebration of the Eucharist. That is, in the, in the Catholic Mass when the priest is able to call down Jesus and change the wafer into the literal body of Christ. Catholic Church does not believe that Jesus is going to visibly and audibly return to this earth. They believe everything that Jesus said about the return or a second coming is fulfilled when they offer the Catholic Mass. And that Jesus in using apocalyptic language is not referring to some, some end time events. That's the official position. Now whether, you know, the Catholic populace would, would know and understand that would be another issue. But this is the official position of Roman Catholicism. Now all of these are broken images of the return of Christ. And, and, and I'm going to tell you something. Chances are, that since the days of the debates back in the 1930s and 40s, you're not going to find many Bible students, members of the church, who are going to be persuaded to accept premillennialism, the return of Christ, Armageddon, and the rapture, and things like that. And certainly we're not going to be influenced by accepting the Catholic idea of the celebration of the Mass and the Eucharist. We're not going to probably uh, be influenced to uh, be date setters or anything like that. But there is an insidious doctrine that pertains to the second coming of Christ that is gaining traction among Christians, among churches of Christ. I've talked about it here in this pulpit. I've talked about it on radio programs. I've written about it. I've discussed it in lectureships with other preachers. And it, it's that which says that Jesus came the second time in 70 A.D. when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman armies led by Titus. Now that's a position that is gaining traction. That's known as the 70 A.D. doctrine. That's known as realized eschatology. That's known as uh, preterism or full preterism, hyperpreterism. And all of those refer to this idea here. That all of, the, all of the second coming prophecies were fulfilled when, when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. This was advocated by a man by the name of Max King initially in the 1970s in Ohio. And from that humble beginning, it has spread tremendously. King has written several books, The Parousia, The Spirit of Prophecy, and he's debated this issue, with us, and, and others of that persuasion has debated it as well. But I want you to notice what King says in The Spirit of Prophecy, page 81 and page 105. He said, there is no time period between the fall of Jerusalem and the second coming of Christ. There's chronious events time-wise. There's no scriptural basis for extending the second coming of Christ beyond the fall of Jerusalem. What this means is, all of the all of the all Jesus coming passages point to the destruction of Jerusalem. There's none points to anything else. 
they all point to the destruction of Jerusalem. There will not be, according to this doctrine, a return of Christ beyond His coming at the destruction of Jerusalem. So, we sing songs about the coming of Christ, we're singing false doctrine. If we talk about the second return of Christ or the coming of Christ when the dead are going to be raised and we're going to stand before God in judgment, we're teaching false doctrine. And like I say, this is gaining traction. This is something that is being accepted. There's a church on the north side of Indianapolis, the North Indianapolis Church of Christ, that is a 70 A.D. group. These people, these people will visit with congregations. And they'll come and they'll be very friendly. And they'll want to set up some secret studies to try to get you to look at these end time prophecies in a little different and unique way. Now you say, does that work? Yes, it works. It works tremendously. There have been area churches that have been affected by this doctrine. We can go back to the 90s when this thing began to erupt here in our area. I, I, it's, it was long before that it was in, the influence was there. Biltmore Gardens in the inner city was affected in the late 90s. Also in the late 90s, this congregation was affected, the Danville Church. In the, in, in the early 2000s, Traders Point was affected when North Indianapolis came over there to try to influence them to accept this doctrine. Recently, there have been some other churches that have been affected by this, Avon Heights and Avon and Greencastle. Now, none of these churches are 70 AD. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying they've had to deal with the problem. And, and this shows you the influence and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the fact that this doctrine the, the shattered image of the return of Christ, it, it can gain traction. And, and Jason was telling me today, it, you know, coincidentally, that this is something that is affecting a church over in eastern Indiana right now. And, and so these are things that we need to be aware of. When you hear this idea that Jesus returned the second time, no other comings of Christ are going to occur at the destruction of Jerusalem, this is the doctrine that's under consideration. The doctrine that was originated by Max King as it affects the churches of Christ. But now, obviously, we wonder, how do they come up with this? Where do they get this? Well, I think a more salient question is, what's the purpose of the doctrine? You know, what's the hook? What, what, what's that which would captivate you to accept it? But let's, let's address this idea of, of how they came to this conclusion. It, it, it's, a, it's a very easy process by which they came to this conclusion. Because you're going to look at some passages of Scripture that obviously refer to the destruction of Jerusalem that says Jesus is coming. Let me show you. Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And He will send His angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And somebody will say, well, you know, that, that's, that's, that's found nestled right into these signs that deal with the destruction of Jerusalem. And it says that Jesus has got, has got to be His second coming. Then they'll look at passages like Luke 21 that obviously discuss the destruction of Jerusalem. Verse 24, They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem would be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Then, that is when Jerusalem is trampled by the Gentiles, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, years ago, Christians, I'm talking about members of the churches of Christ, were known as people of the book. That is, we knew the Bible. And we knew how to handle the Bible in a right way. And we're to rightly divide the word of truth. 
But I would be willing to say that a good number of us, and I'm not talking about us just in this building, I'm talking about generally speaking, would have difficulty answering the 70 AD's arguments on this. Now, what? That's obviously. That's obviously referring to Jesus coming and destruction of Jerusalem. That's got to be the second coming that, that he's talking about. What we need to do in order to combat that is, is we've got to do a complete study in the New Testament on the comings of Christ. And I use that in a plural way. Because I want you to hear, hear me closer now. The New Testament, we often talk about the second coming of Christ as though there was just one coming and then there's going to be the second. First, second, first, last. But actually, once you get into your Bible, you're going to see that the Bible speaks of a multiple comings of Christ. And so this is what we've got to understand. There are many comings of Christ that are mentioned in the Bible. Good Bible students are going to be able to separate this coming of Christ from this coming of Christ, from this coming of Christ, and from this coming of Christ. And if we're not able to do that, then we're going to be swept away into this broken concept of the return of Christ. Now let me, let, let, let me show you what I mean here. Let's think about this. His birth, is often referred to as the first advent, the first coming, is referred to as a coming. You go back to Malachi chapter 3 and chapter 4. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord. This has reference to when Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem. Behold, I will send you Elijah. Of course, that was uh, in reference to John the Baptist coming in the spirit of Elijah, Matthew 11. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Both of these passages refer to the first coming of Jesus. His birth was referred to as a coming. Well, somebody said, well, that's, that's, that's logical. Well, let's look, let's look at some other comings. There are representative comings comings of Jesus. And, and what we mean by that is He's going to come, but He's going to use something else as a, represent, as a representative of Himself. For example, He comes through the Word. John 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves Me, he will keep My Word, and My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. This is not talking about the second coming of Christ. It's talking about Jesus having fellowship with us through His Word. You see, that is referred to as a coming of Christ. Now let's notice another representative coming. He comes in spiritual fellowship. Revelation 3 and verse 20 to the church at Laodicea. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. That's not talking about the second coming. That's talking about Jesus coming in fellowship with those who open the door of their hearts to the Lord. You see, all we're doing is a Bible study. All we're doing is rightly dividing the word truth and trying to come away understanding what is being said. Another representative coming is that He comes in judgment in a local church. Remember the letter to the seven churches? Jesus told the church at Pergamum, Revelation 2 and verse 16, Repent or else I will come to you quickly. And I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's not talking about the second coming. That's talking about passing judgment on a local congregation that's not doing what it ought to do. Will Jesus come and pass judgment on that church? Absolutely. Will He come personally and physically and audibly and visibly? No. But He will pass judgment upon that church and it's referred to as a coming. Then there is the conditional comings of Christ. That is, I'm going to come and judge you unless you do something. For instance, 
church at Ephesus, Revelation 2 and verse 5, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. I asked a man one time when we were studying the issue of the 70 AD doctrine, he already took the position that every coming passage in the New Testament referred to Jesus coming and the destruction of Jerusalem. My question to him was simple. I read Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5, and I said, does this passage refer to Jesus coming in judgment upon Jerusalem? And he said, indeed it does. I said, so you're telling me then that if the church at Ephesus had repented, Jesus would not have come and destroyed Jerusalem. He said, well, now back over here in Zechariah. I said, I'm going to talk about Zechariah. <laughs> we'll talk about Zechariah in a moment. But I'm talking about this passage. Well, but i gotta, I, I, I got to talk to you about Zechariah. I said, I told you we'll talk about Zechariah. I said, as a matter of fact, we'll talk about Zechariah right now if you will look me in the eye and tell me I don't want to answer that question. He said, I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> and so we talked about Zechariah which kind of skirted the issue. But that's a conditional coming. Then Jesus did come in judgment upon Jerusalem. He did. Nobody's going to deny that. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now did Jesus come literally and personally, visibly and audibly no, he came representatively. But when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies. Destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. And so, yes, Jesus came in destruction of, uh, upon the destruction of Jerusalem. Yes, Jesus came in judgment upon the church at Pergamum. Yes, Jesus was going to come in judgment upon the church at Ephesus unless they repented. There are a lot of references. Yes, Jesus will have fellowship with us if we open the door of our heart. He'll come in and fellowship us. None of these are referring to the second coming of Christ. Jesus will come again. There are too many passages that prophesy of this. Hebrews 9.27 Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for Him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. That's yet in the future. Furthermore, we can read in John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in, in, in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to Myself. That's a promise that we have from Jesus. Then there's in 1 John 3 and verse 2, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Not secret, not in the destruction of Jerusalem, that is at His second coming. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ when? At His coming. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then this is what Peter says will also occur at that day. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Let me tell you something. When Jesus comes as a thief in the night, it's not just simply unobserved. It's unannounced. And you're going to observe these things that happen if we happen to be alive at that time. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since, we, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Let me ask you, since that's going to happen, what should be your priority? What should be the thing that you focus on? Uh, that's going to happen. Jesus is going to return. He's not going to set foot upon this earth. We're going to be caught up to be with Him forever. But He's going to return and this world is going to be destroyed. It's going to be burned up. 
All the elements will melt. This earth will be no more. Time will be no more. So the question is, how ought we to be living since that's going to occur? I, I tell you, it gets right down to it. We need to ask ourselves, are we going to be ready when Jesus calls our name at His second coming? You know, we sing a song sometimes. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. And that day is going to occur. It will happen. Do not accept these shattered ideas, these false doctrines pertaining to the second coming of Christ. It will occur in the future. That's a promise that we have. All I know, there are scoffers. There have always been. Peter talks about those in 2 Peter 3 who say, well, where is His coming? All things continue on as it was from the creation. Peter says in this, they're willingly ignorant. And there are a lot of willingly ignorant people. But I trust that we are not among those. If you're not a Christian and you're not ready for the Lord's return, you need to make some changes, drastic changes even this evening. If you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and you're willing to repent of your sins, as turn from them, Confess your faith in the Messiah. Be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. You can be ready. And you can be somewhere listening when Jesus calls your name. You're subject to the invitation. Why don't you come right now? It's together we stand and ask we sing.